Hello everyone, you're listening to The Political Animals and I'm your host Jonathan Kole and today I'm bringing you another tasty intellectual snack. Specifically today we'll be dining on some Greek cuisine at a little restaurant you may have heard of called Aristotle's. And in particular I want to focus on his immortal concept of the political animal. Before I dive into Aristotle, however, I feel like I need to explain one oddity at the beginning of the show, which is I introduced myself as Jonathan Kolle, and I just wanted to explain that. It's uh, something of a funny story, actually. It does have a Greek connection. My wife is actually Greek, and for reasons far too involved to go into in a little intellectual snack like this, I happen to be a fluent Greek speaker. When my wife and I got married at the tender age of 21, we flew off to Indonesia for our honeymoon, specifically the island of Lombok, which is just to the right of Bali, if you're looking at it from down under. And of course, my surname is actually Cole, spelt C-O-L-E, and every Indonesian we encountered called me Mr. Kole, because I suppose that's a logical pronunciation if you're going phonetically by English, and that's not your native language. Now, the interesting thing is that Kole in Greek actually means ass. Uh, the, the word is actually kolos, but in the evocative, which is what you have to use when you're addressing someone in Greek, you pronounce it Kole. And so everywhere we went, I was being called Mr. Ass, and my wife and I found this absolutely hilarious. And so till this very day, uh, occasionally my wife will call out to me as Mr. Kole, and we'll all laugh. My son, my nine-year-old son, finds it utterly amusing. So that's a little uh, (laughs) Greek anecdote to begin. All right, turning from the absurd to the sublime... Aristotle's concept of the political animal is first introduced in a work called Politics, in Book 1, in fact, right at the beginning of Book 1. I should just say a little bit about about the book in terms of when it was written, how it was written. We think it was reached its final form probably in the 330s BC. Uh, it wasn't actually penned by Aristotle. He probably didn't write a single word. Uh, there's a scholarly consensus that it was compiled by students who put together the various lecture notes taken from his lectures, which does mean it's a relatively reliable reflection, at least, of the great man's thought. But it's not actually a book per se written by Aristotle. Okay, let me read the full quote to give you the full context in which the concept of political animal occurs. Hence, it is evident that the state is a creation of nature, and that man is by nature a political animal. And he who by nature and not by mere accident is without a state is either a bad man or above humanity. This deceptively simple statement is jam-packed full of big philosophical ideas and some complex linguistic issues bound up in the translation of Greek to English. So allow me to unpack a couple of these big ideas and concepts for you. The first thing to note is that the adjective political, which in Greek in this context is politikon, politikon zon, political animal, is actually just the adjective of polis. So in actual fact, the best way to read this passage is not that man is by nature a political animal, but rather man is by nature a polis animal. What is a polis, I hear you asking? Well, a polis is a self-sufficient community of citizens sharing in rights and duties for the express aim of promoting the good life. A second issue of linguistic interest to note here is that the term translated in English man isn't actually man in Greek. There is a Greek term for man, of course, which is aner, but the term used here by Aristotle is anthropos, which means human. So it turns out Aristotle isn't quite the sexist pig that we think he is. Well, in fact, he is just not in this passage, and that needs to be duly noted. Thus, in actual fact, a more accurate translation, albeit a more literal translation, but why not, it works, would be that the human is by nature a polis animal. Alrighty, that's enough of linguistic issues. Let's dive into the substance. We've eaten our hors d'oeuvre, now we want to get into the 
the main course, although this is supposed to be a snack, so that analogy just went a wry big time. Never mind, stay with me. I want to focus on this issue of nature. This is the all-important concept in this quote. Aristotle's philosophy of politics, or what you might call his foundational account of politics, is what I would describe as a naturalistic account, which again directs our attention to his understanding of nature. Now, Aristotle had what would best be described as a teleological view or understanding of nature, which used to say that he thought everything that exists exists for a specific end or purpose, and moreover, that that purpose could be discerned and understood through a combination of empirical observation and rationalistic analysis. So in the context, returning back to the idea of the human being being a polis animal, is that the polis, that political association with rights and duties aimed at promoting or realizing the good life or the the best life or really living well, evzin is one of the terms used in the Greek there, was the natural end of humans. That is, that nature drove humans or the nature of humans drove them to this particular type of existence, this particular mode of existence. Now, lest you think this is just all abstract philosophizing, he actually tries to justify this through an argument. And it's not a crazy argument, in fact. And again, here, I just need to note a point on methodology. A lot of people think methodology is boring. I happen to be obsessed by it. Aristotle was a kind of proto-reductionist. He thought that the best way to understand anything was to, if you like, deconstruct the whole or reduce it down to its smallest indivisible component. So he looks at the polis, this large association of human beings, and he says, okay, what is the smallest component? Well, obviously the smallest component is the human being, and they come in two varieties, man and woman. Now he thought, or he observed, that the man and woman have a natural instinct towards procreation. In other words, towards a union which creates a family. So he thought, okay, well, what happens when you have a family? You have a lot of kids, they get married, they have more kids. Before you know it, you're living in a village with multiple related families. And if this natural process, again, I emphasize the word natural, procreation being natural, an instinct, as he notes, observed in all animal species, or at least uh, mammals. I don't know how insects copulate, but um, (laughs) I will not be doing a podcast on that either. In any event, getting back on track, the village eventually expands to a point where you have multiple villages that make up a polis. What is he saying? He's saying, look, the polis is a collection ultimately of families which arise naturally. But of course, the polis is more than just a vehicle for the practicalities of family existence, that is satisfying their basic needs of food, shelter, clothing. It's much more than that. This again brings in this notion of the good life. That is, the polis is that unique political association that allows humans to transcend, if you like, their animal instincts, their animal drives, and to turn them into tr- something truly remarkable, which is civilization, I guess we would use, is the term we would use now. And this brings us to the ugly side of this idea which is that humans who do not live in a polis, and there were many humans in Aristotle's day not living in a polis, uh, what you have to understand about the Greek world in that time is that you have these discrete city-states that um, have a sort of urban centre surrounded by farm or agricultural land, and in the midst of all these different independent city-states, the borders of which didn't actually abut were loads of nomads. These are the barbarians that the Greeks spoke spoke of, living, if you like, what we would now perhaps regard as a kind of indigenous primitive existence. He looked at those people and he thought, well, given my teleological understanding of nature, and it seems like the natural end of humans is to live in a polis, these people must be subhuman because they're not living in a polis because... Everything that exists fulfills its natural end. They clearly have a different end. And hence, out of this, we have the awful justification of slavery. Now, although Aristotle's political animal, or his concept of the political animal, serves in many respects as a cautionary tale about the perils of trying to derive political norms from nature, that is a big, big lesson that comes out of this 
there is something very positive that I take out of this and I want to encourage you to think about. We live in an age of extreme cultural anxiety, conflict, apprehension, nervousness. We, we live in an age of great doom and gloom. It's almost an apop- apocalyptic age. You only need to look at the renaissance of the film genre, my personal favorite, by the way, of the post-apocalypse, you know, the post-apocalyptic. The, the Walking Dead is a complete study uh, in our fears <laughs> that civilization could just come crashing down at any moment and that this whole facade could just crumble. I'm not going to say that those fears and apprehensions are entirely unwarranted. I think there are some valid reasons for consternation, although I think we take it to hyperbolic proportions often. The thing I get from Aristotle is just a reminder, actually, let's face it, if we're being honest, we are still living the good life, aren't we? Aren't we all utterly blessed to be polis animals? I mean, if you're listening to this from Australia or America or Canada, any country in Europe, uh, many countries in Asia, many countries in the Middle East even, we are some of the healthiest, most prosperous, best educated, most knowledgeable humans with the most leisure time known in history. There is still a sense, although it's utterly obscured by our political discourse, in which The polis does, for all its dysfunction, and don't get me wrong, (laughs) there's plenty of dysfunction, and it's not a sort of self-operating organism. It needs to be tended and cared for, a bit like a garden. It reminds me of the Garden of Eden. (laughs) But in the midst of all this, you've got to ask yourself, I mean, aren't we, isn't the polis still functioning in the way Aristotle thought it should as its natural end, as a vehicle, a political association, which does promote the good life, unevenly, often unjustly. But for those of us for whom it does promote the good life, we can't ignore that, right? And that is an insight that goes all the way back to Aristotle. It's all about balance. In any event, I'm starting to get a bit preachy, so let me sign off and say from this political animal to you political animal, like, subscribe, follow, rate, share.